now. So once again, hello everyone and welcome to today's event. And the event is, uh, as the topic says, about mental well-being awareness and specifically for South Asian women. And we have um, a couple of really interesting things around what we are going to be discussing today. For those of you who are uh, familiar with what I've been doing, thank you so much. I really appreciate your support. I honestly, deeply from the bottom of my heart, thank you for joining me when I do these events. I think that's, that's what is the biggest encouragement for me. Uh, I will be sharing via email as a follow-up for whoever's registered details of um, where, where the recording of this event is going to go. I'm going to be sharing details of links of what I do so you can read up more about it as, you know, um, after the event, learn more about that. So more to follow on that one. I'd like to start off now by welcoming our guests for today. So we have with us Shweta Vikram. Now, those of you, if you saw the Eventbrite link, Shweta is hugely distinguished in her field. She is uh, an author. She is a um, holistic coach. She is an Ayurveda specialist, and she is many other things. So Shweta, I'm just going to let you do the detailed introduction. Over to you. Thank you so much, Supreet. That is um, very flattering. And I'm like wondering, what do I say now? I'd, I'd like to start by just saying, Thanks to Nana and Supreet for being a part of this team and Supreet, obviously your initiative completely and to everyone who's joined today, you know, May happens to be mental health awareness month. And um, I, I don't know how many of you keep up with the numbers. I'm a number geek when it comes to mental health and stuff. And it, it just, on one hand, South Asian community, it's, it's very progressive in terms of when you look at economic growth, education, all of that. But when it comes to mental health, we are one of those communities that don't often seek out help. We, and this is here in the West, right? Be it the US, Canada, or UK. Um, and then back home in South Asia, there is this whole mindset, oh, it's all up in your head. Oh, or that one is crazy. So we have these labels and taboos, which we'll get into. Um, so when Supreet you know, approached me and wanted to get this conversation going, I was like, Absolutely. We talk so much as a community, but we don't talk about things oftentimes, which are very important, which is especially mental health of South Asian women without all these taboos and labels and stigma and fear. Thank you, Shweta. And we're just going to start the conversation. I want to first introduce Nena. Nena, you're going to wonder what is the connection between what Nena does and mental health. And we're going to get into that as well. So Nena is um, a passionate Cook. I think that's Nena the best way that I can describe you. Nena runs Culinary Karma. And Nena, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, thanks, Supreet. Hi, everyone. And thank you for joining us again. Um, so I am professionally a graphic designer by profession, but then uh, by nature, I'm a passionate foodie. <laughs> I just love food, anything to do with food, ingredients. Um, I just love it. And, uh, you know, when I go to a supermarket and I go crazy over like if a tomato is looking good, I kind of like stop and look at the tomato. I'm like, oh my God, this is such a good looking tomato. So you can say that people go to the mall to shop. I go to the grocery stores. <laughs> um, so that's how much I like cooking. Um, just because it's my passion, I started Culinary Karma where I would, I can, I just put up the recipes that I cook at home, easy recipes recipes that I borrow inspirations from all over the world, actually. So I take inspirations from Middle Eastern food, from Japanese food, from Korean food. Um, obviously, it's um, Indian food also most of the time. Um, and uh, that's me. And I'm trying to write a book, thanks to Shweta, <laughs> uh, with all the motivation and inspiration that Shweta has been given me. Um, and hopefully the book will be out next year, uh, if not this year. <laughs> Um, and so that's, that's my biggest dream is to publish my own book. Once that's done, I can sit back, relax and be like, okay, I'm done now. I can go up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite sure by the time you have your book ready, you'll be on to your next project. And, and I'm, I'm going to segue a little bit here and, and share with everybody that the one thing that I got some great advice on and I learned is the importance of baby steps. So, you know, you've talked about looking at a tomato and really wanting to admire that tomato. And from there, you've gone to setting yourself a target of writing a book. Well, baby steps. So for everybody out there, whatever you want to do in life, 
the baby steps. You start with those and you build as you go. And Nana, you're just an example of that. Thank so you. welcome and we look forward to hearing more. Now I'm going to start with Shweta, Nana, and after that we'll move to you. And then yeah. uh, for everyone, we will open this up for discussion and conversation. Sure. So Shweta and Nena, welcome both of you. And like I said, Shweta, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell us, firstly, I'm going to combine two questions. The, the part one of my question is, what is really meant by mental health? And then the second part of my question is, how do you fit in? What's your role? What do you do? Um, I love that question uh, because uh, there is, there's just so much weight attached to mental health. When I, when I say, when I give, like, say these things, make these informal declarations, I mean, pertaining to South Asian community, we, it's, to me, it's just your mental well-being. We oftentimes forget, like, our mind is part of our body, and we take such good care of our body. If we floss our teeth, why don't we floss our mind? So the mental well-being, that aspect um, is mental health to me. Just the way physical health is, what you eat, how you exercise, do you move? mental health is your anxiety your stress the depression do you meditate so that's a little bit about and i'm not a therapist so the way i approach mental health is i'm a writer primarily and i write a lot about women's empowerment and women's wellness and i've i've realized like in and I, I grew up across three different continents so i was just curious like picking up stories here and there and one story that stuck with me and i think primarily is the driving force why I've been so fascinated with the human mind and human behavior is one of my friend's mother. I mean, if you're in South Asian kid and if you grew up in South Asia, everyone has had a thapar once in a while. Um, and it's, it's kind of the upbringing, right? And like, but this, his mom was like auntie was beyond the thapar range. So like if we, you know, you go to their place and you'd ask him, Hey, do you want to go play like bunch of us? And she's like, no, finish your dinner. And if he hadn't finished his dinner, she would take, I've seen her take sag and spread it on his face. If he didn't brush his teeth, there used to be surf. She would be like, you know, go rinse your mouth with this. So while all the other aunties and my mom, they were all like the, you know, the label crazy. Right. And all the kids were like wondering all of us, okay, my mom just gave me a thupper. So she's okay. Like she doesn't put like sag on my face as a face pack. And this was me in third grade. I just got very curious about why was she different and what, what made her do what she did. Um, and I think that's where my journey started. So as a writer and as an Ayurveda coach, I started focusing a lot. Like, so my characters are very nuanced because I'm always getting into the brain space and how it impacts women all together. Um, hence the start of my journey with mental health. You know, I, I have to say this is a very interesting example that you've spoken about this particular lady. I, I, I think when you talk about it, we clearly realize that she's obviously struggling, which is why she's, you know, behaving the way she is. But uh, unfortunately, it's equally real that what we tend to do rather than empathize or sympathize is be judgmental. And I think that is one of the root causes of the fact that South Asian community as a whole doesn't even acknowledge that there could be mental health issues. Absolutely. What do you feel about that? Um, you know, I, emotional honesty, unfortunately, is not a part of the culture. So the culture is what will people say? What will they think? Um, and we are so, I mean, if you talk to an elderly person from within the South Asian, they're like, oh, I have diabetes. Oh, I have blood pressure. It's like a brag point. Like they have these trophies, right? But the minute you start to talk about mental health, some might say it's all in your head. And some might say, go talk to somebody in your family. Like there is denial. There's a lot of denial. And again, because of the taboo and stigma, I, I know of people who wanted to talk about it and their own friends stop talking to them because all of a sudden it's like, treated as a contagious disease. So there is no emotional honesty, which creates, there is lack of space for these conversations. Like I said, we talk about physical diseases. People will talk about cancer. They'll talk about diabetes or even a fever or headache, but anything below the chin, we are okay talking about within our culture, anything above that. And we forget, which is what Ayurveda focuses on. We are a mind body connection. You can't treat it as two separate things. 
I love what you've said about emotional honesty, and I love how you've talked about the fact that it's there's a, there's a com connection. We often forget that we are one whole being rather than bits and parts of a lung and a heart and things like that. And therefore, what we feel inside is as important as what we feel physically. So now you said as an Ayurveda coach, people forget that. What does it mean for you to be an Ayurveda? This is very interesting, actually. I've never heard of anyone being an Ayurveda coach. So tell us more. That's what we want to know about. Ayurveda is beautiful. And I get goosebumps when I talk about Ayurveda. It's mm -hmm. as if like, I'm talking about like a boyfriend or something, right? <laughs> Happily married, by the way. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, because I have like in-law signing in for this one. I was like, nice. This is COVID-19 due to our daughter-in-law. Um, like what I love about Ayurveda is it's very intuitive. It's it's an art. It's a science. It's basically living life with the rhythm of nature, right? And it's customized. Just because the world says eat kale, everybody shouldn't be eating kale. That's a whole beauty. Like food combinations, um, and also so the way Ayurveda and Chinese medicine work, it's like we're made up of five elements. It's air, ether, which is also space, fire, water, earth, and it's the combination of these elements individual like like the dna right so at birth it's sort of predetermined who we are based on our vedic constitution and that impacts who we end up becoming so what we eat impacts how we think um not like i said like not everybody should give up rice but not everybody should be eating rice so from an Ayurvedic perspective, you are never labeled like so even when it's depression or it's anxiety or it's stress, you know, they look at it as imbalance, which element is imbalanced. And so obviously, if it's an extreme case, you're seeing a psychotherapist, you're getting a treatment. But like with COVID-19 and focusing on women specifically, we are all stressed. We all have some level of anxiety. But when you have conversations within the South Asian community, we often think anxiety means a panic attack. No, anxiety could mean you're just sleeping too much. Anxiety could mean you're eating too much. Anxiety could mean you're talking too much. And again, from, from an Ayurvedic perspective, that is an increase in the air and ether element in our bodies, which increases. So what if we ate foods or lived a lifestyle that reduced that vata? So that's where the Ayurveda angle comes in. It's not putting these labels, you are this. It's like, it's a lifestyle of prevention and maintenance before it gets to the disease state. So this is really interesting because I think we're all very conscious nowadays of, you know, oh, don't have too much sugar, you'll get a sugar rush, sugar rush. But we don't take that beyond that to actually thinking about the other foods that we eat and the kind of impact that they have on us individually. So, you know, we would love to really know more about that. And also picking up of, on one more point that you made about uh, stress eating is something that is commonly known and understood. I, I stress eat, I think, you know, many of us do it at many points in our lives. But it's interesting that you're even talking about somebody who's talking too much. So there are, that means there are clear behaviors which denote that a person is under stress. And right. so in a way, it becomes incumbent upon all of us to, rather than be judgmental about those behaviors, to actually say, okay, you're going through a tough time. Let's sit down and have, have a chat. Or, you know, maybe there's something I can do to help you or anything like that. And, and we don't have to be holistic coaches. We just have to be human beings reaching out to another human being there. Absolutely. And sometimes just holding a safe space, Supreet, like sometimes we, people don't want to hear anything. I you know, have friends, family, or, or some clients, like sometimes they just want you to hold space for them. Like what you stay stays there just because you say, I am so sick of my kid today, or I'm so, I'm so sick of my husband today. I had to cook this. Doesn't mean you hate them. Yeah, the point is you just stress, the anxiety is high. So to just create that safe space, because again, like I said, in extreme cases, you know, you go see a psychotherapist or whatever be the path that your doctor recommends. But in the beginning, just simple conversations of I'm there for you, that alone can be very um, soul satisfying. And that's, that's a lovely thing to say, I'm there for you. So now back to Ayurveda. I did, you know, for everyone who's, who's with us today, one of the things that Shweta did say is that she's going to share with us some things about Ayurveda. And I was like, well, the one thing I know about Ayurveda is that turmeric is good for you. And that's, that's kind of, and she was like, yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. So Shweta, you have something to share for our audience. So we'd love to hear from you. So, yeah, so um, like I said, you know, um, the way, we're, and we need Western medicine, let me profess by saying that, like, but with Western medicine, when you have a fever, what's the thing? Take a Tylenol. 
have a headache, take, a, um, take an Advil. It's always like never treating the symptoms, right? In Ayurveda, it's like, okay, what, what did you eat the night before? Uh, who did you talk to the night before? What was your life like the night before? How did you sleep? So our body has this immense power to heal. And in Ayurveda, I won't get into that, the six stages before something turns into a disease. So can we catch it in the earlier stages? You know, before the anxiety turns into a massive mental health issue, can we catch it before that? So that's the whole idea. Um, so self-care is extremely important. So I want to share five really super quick things. Please take breaks and make time for you. Women, especially South Asian women, we have been taught to place ourselves at the bottom of the totem pole and be these beautiful sacrificial goats all the time for everyone. You know what? We cannot serve anyone from an empty space. You have to take care. And again, take care doesn't mean anything big. Yeah, sure enough, if the world was the way it was, you know, we could go for our massages or shopping, whatever does it for you, you know, or like acupuncture, whatever have you. But at this point, it could be just sitting with a cup of tea and coffee and telling your family, these 15 minutes are mine, unless you're on fire, please don't come disturb me. So, you know, having these honest conversations, like very often as women, we assume people will get it. We are very empathetic. Men are wired differently. So it's not that they're trying to diss you. They might not get it. So spell it out. Like I need to make time for myself 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening, the kids are yours, right? Second thing is move your body. Um, whether it's yoga or it's walking or it's Pilates, whatever does it for you, running, weights, high intensity, we have a gazillion options right now. The reason I say move your body is because when we exercise, endorphins are released. Those are our happy hormones. And again, we are all in a state of anxiety. And again, with South Asian women, our every emotion is through food, right? We are sad, we cook, we eat. We are happy, we cook, we, we mourn, we cook and eat. And, you know, when we celebrate, we do that. So right now, it's like the entire freaking family. Yeah, you're cooking one meal, right? So move your body to release that. Again, you also don't want health disorders on the other hand. When this is over, and I'm like, oh, wow, nothing fits. So it's not about being a, a certain size. It's about feeling good in your body. And that just comes from moving your body to disconnect. So we live in this world and God bless technology. We all hear despite what the mayhem that COVID-19 has created, but disconnect, disconnect from social media, disconnect from emails, like make it a practice, something as simple as maybe leave your phone. Now your family is at home, right? So you're not worried. Will my kid call from college or is my, if my, my partner is traveling, just disconnect, leave the phone outside in a room. Don't check it until the next morning. Because again, when we see the phone is the last thing, if you see before you go to bed, you're going to be in a very high, heightened state your anxiety is going to be much higher, right? Uh, meditate. I know people are like, meditation can feel like a very um, complex thing because that's how it's talked about. Like, now close your eyes. Now don't think. No, none of that. Just make a diamond shape, place it over your belly button. And I just made fun of close your eyes. But yeah, close your eyes and, feel, and breathe. Just feeling your breath, like as your tummy comes out and goes in, feeling that against your palm. So yeah, you're making a diamond and you're putting it above your belly button. Yeah. So, so just like this, just, and like then this. just like this and place it with your belly button in the center. So belly button is in the center. Right. Just like close your eyes and then breathe out. So you'll feel like your belly pressing against that diamond and breathe it. And after a point, don't even manipulate your breathing. Just let it be natural. So as you slow, your, slow down your breath, you're lowering your anxiety as well. Otherwise, we're constantly in fight or flight mode. Your adrenals are like overshot. Okay. Can you do this while sitting or do you need to lie down to do this? Absolutely. While sitting. And even if you do it twice a day, five minutes, everybody has 10 minutes a day for themselves. Yeah. Right. So sitting at, your, sitting at your work desk, you yeah. take a break, you know, finish a Zoom call. And before you start off with whatever you're doing next, just do this for five minutes, center yourself a little bit and get back to work. Yes. And because it relaxes your parasympathetic nervous system. So you're not constantly in this mode. Yeah. You know, it just, and you'll notice like you're, once you're doing this, you'll notice like your, your heart is not going thump, thump, thump. It's at a normal pace. Yeah. You'll feel your nerves loosen up, right? And the last thing I wanted to talk about was, I mean, I've been loving social media pictures of all the food that people have been cooking. I've had my own uh, moments as well. Um, 
cook nourishing meals. You know, this COVID-19 is going to be here for a while. So don't exhaust yourself by getting into a daily production of five things on the dinner table. It was fine the first week when we were all like, oh, we're going to be fine by the end of March, but that's not happening clearly. Um, because there's a big brain and gut connection. The kind of our gut is called our second brain, right? Because almost 85% of serotonin is released in your gut. So what you eat, it impacts your gut bacteria and that directly impacts your brain. And so, what is the function of serotonin? Happiness, calmness, ah. all the good stuff. And you know, Ayurveda has been talking about this for thousands of years. Now, uh, Western medicine practitioners are also seeing the brain uh, gut connection. So if you're just feeding it sugar, like you said, Supreet, there'll be inflammation. So your gut is not getting anything nutritious. So you notice if you eat sugar three days in a row, the fourth day you might feel low. You might feel unmotivated. So from an Ayurvedic perspective, the earth element in your body along with the water element has gone up. It makes you lethargic, low, depressed. But from a Western perspective, there's so much inflammation. There's no good information going up to your brain. So your brain doesn't know how to comprehend feeling good. Right. So this is where I would love to introduce Nana because she is the queen of awesome cooking. And <laughs> what I love, and I've eaten her food. And what I love about Nana is one of her posts that I saw. It was orange cake or some dessert that you made, right? Yes, yeah. orange cake. <laughs> That's what I love. Like, you know, we don't have to stress about I need to make this, but I don't have this ingredient. So someone needs to go to the store. No, make do with what you have. It's important to eat meals made with love and nourishment. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, Nana, because you know how to whip up like these fancy meals. And then you also know to whip up simple, delicious, heartwarming meals based on what's in your pantry and refrigerator. So on to you. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Shweta. Um, so like Shweta said, uh, I, like, I love cooking. And obviously, my pantry is full of um, every kind of ingredients. So at a given day, I can make a Mediterranean food. I can make a Chinese food. I can make an Indian food. I can make any, any kind of food, French food. But at the same time, um, it's also what is available. And especially now these days, you know, we're not going out shopping so much. Um, and like Shweta said about the orange cake, that actually was a banana cake recipe. And I didn't have bananas, but I had a lot of those tiny um, uh, clementines. Um, you know, when you keep them for some time, they kind of go a little hard and they spoil. And I didn't want them to get spoiled because obviously there are people out there who are, you know, they don't have food to eat. And here I have oranges that's going bad that I will have to throw them away. So I just put them skin and everything because they were organic into my cake. And honestly, I don't think I'll ever bake banana bread again because I think that's going to be orange cake from now on. Um, well, so I'm going to be asking you for that recipe for sure. sure absolutely. <laughs> so so for, for, for um, everyone today who's with us, I just want to also briefly say, uh, Nena, when you and I were talking earlier about coming on to this event and, you know, you talking about cooking, one of the things that we spoke quite deeply about was the your influences about how you got into cooking mm -hmm. and also in terms of what it means to make a nourishing meal and you know your passion for not just cooking but also for making sure that you're providing healthy nutritious food so talk to us a little bit about that okay so um you know like growing up in india uh, especially every girl is um, supposed to know how to cook <laughs> and I am the youngest of five sisters and I never stepped into the kitchen. Uh, I just was not interested. My sisters were great cook. My mom was a phenom phenomenal cook. And um, I just didn't uh, think that I was, you know, I wanted to go into the kitchen. And as typical as an Indian mom, my mother would always say, I don't know how she's going to feed her husband when she gets married, <laughs> because that was what was required in those days, right? Uh, and then my mother happened to travel to US uh, to my sister because she was having a baby and I was alone with my dad and my father loves cooking. And that's when he started engaging me in the kitchen. I was like, you cut the garlic and I'll saute this. And then I would get yelled at because I would not cut the slices properly. <laughs> and um, after some time I was like, wow, this is fun. This is really fun. Uh, how come I never did this before? Now, obviously, uh, you know, uh, through osmosis, uh, I was kind of taking in what my mom was cooking, but kind of like just denying the fact that, no, I wanted to cook, but it was kind of seeping in into me, into my personality. And I completely did not realize that till I got married and I came here then. And then turns out my husband is a foodie as well. 
And then he would ask me, do you know how to make dosas? I was like, uh, no. <laughs> do you know how to make dal? I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and then I started cooking. And once I started cooking, I went outside and I saw that there was something called asparagus, which I had never seen in my life before. Something called as artichokes. I'm like, what in the world is this? And that intrigued me so much. And all of a sudden, I just fell in love. So what started as a simmer in India kind of came to a full boil here in this country. And, and you know, I love that you say that because we find that happens so often. We have little things that maybe interest us a little, little bit and we never really go down that path. And then something happens to trigger you going down that path. And like you said, brings it to a full boil. Yes, yes. And thankfully, my husband is a great sport, very encouraging. And uh, if he didn't like something, it's not that he would not eat it. He would just say, um, don't make that again. <laughs> but he would still eat that first time. So that gave me a lot of encouragement. And here I am 24 years later, totally, totally and passionate about cooking and in love with food. That's lovely to hear, Nena. One of the things I really do want to ask you is, you know, you've, you've, like you said, more than 20 years and you've been doing a whole amount of cooking and obviously it's a passion. What are people's attitudes towards someone who's so fond of cooking? Are they always positive? Uh, yes, for the most part, yes. Uh, you know, I, I do have a great support group, great group of friends and family who love what I do and love my food. But then on this other spectrum, there are also people, you know, because my food is not as oily, it doesn't have too much garam masala, if I may say so. Um, I know a garam masala is very important in every Indian kitchen. And I, yes, I do have it too. But honestly, I don't use it as much as anybody else would. Because I feel like it masks the whole flavor of the other flavors. And I'm kind of in love with a lot of other kind of cuisines in India. South Indian cuisine, Gujarati cuisine, uh, from Bengal especially. Um, you know, garam masala is not the major component. So there are people who, yes, I still have friends who are not very fond of what I do, but then on the other spectrum and a bigger spectrum, I have friends who love what I do. So, uh, and I, I just cook with my heart. So honestly, at the end of the day, is food is subjective, right? So it, if I, it's also about your palate. Some people may not like it. Some people may like it, but that doesn't stop me from doing what I do. <laughs> Uh, that's fantastic. And that's exactly why I asked the question, because we did have this conversation earlier. What I wanted to share with everyone was that uh, all of us today are beginning to realize that what was traditionally considered good cooking isn't necessarily good cooking today, because traditionally lives were physically very active. So eating lots of spices, eating lots of, you know, heavy protein, uh, heavy, creamy, rich food, worked and that doesn't today so nutrition has a different meaning for us today and and it's important for us to actually provide nutritious food and when i say us i want to expand the us over here from women to everyone it is no longer the responsibility only of women to cook it is the responsibility of everyone it's a life skill you have to know how to cook so this is where i want to bring in for those of you who were at my last event and we spoke about get men in the game which was about getting men to also work in the kitchen and covid 19 is a fantastic opportunity for men to do that it's a great opportunity for us to start opening up mindsets to start opening up thought processes to say cooking is not just one person's remit in the house it's like anything else you do in the house um, I, I saw somebody's Facebook post and it really resonated with me, which said that when a man is doing chores around the house, he's not helping his wife. He's simply doing chores around the house. I saw that one too, Suprita. I love it. <laughs> and it's so true because that's what it is. Cooking is another chore or another thing that you need to do. And the better you are at it, the better you physically will be. Because we've just learned from even Shweta that, you know, what you eat makes so much of a difference. So I asked Nena to actually put together a couple of nice, easy to make recipes for us. And, uh, and Nena, I'm going to invite you to share those recipes. She sent me a couple of pictures as she was going through the recipes. So I'm going to put the pictures up for all of you to see as she talks about them. Uh, very simple, very wholesome, nutritious uh, food, quick to, to put together meals. And I, and I specifically requested it be food that, you know, people who are not very familiar in the kitchen can still put together. And she was like, absolutely. So Nena, over to you. And I'm going to start sharing your pictures. Uh, sure. Over to you for your first recipe. 
Um, I'll wait for the picture to come up. Okay. I bit because I'm not sure which one are you putting up. Uh, right. That's what I've got. Okay. So this is the pizza toast. Yes. <laughs> So this again is a very simple recipe and I'm sure everybody makes this at home, but this is very um, um, dear to my heart is because my father taught me this. This is one of the kitchen experiments that we did when uh, I was, you know, with him um, alone at, with him uh, while my mom was away. Um, again, it's so easy to put together. So over here, you know, I have all the ingredients that usually we have in our fridge, onions, cilantro, chilies, capsicums, or green peppers. Cheese, I've used pepper jack over here because we like our food spicy. <laughs> and then some Alfredo sauce. Now you don't have to make the sauce. The sauce can be store-bought. And if you don't have the Alfredo sauce, you can also have the tomato sauce that you have, you know, the Italian tomato sauce from the bottle in the kitchen, uh, in your fridge. So um, if you want to simply go to the next slide. Basically, you're just mixing everything. You put the gas on very slow uh, uh, on a flat pan let it heat for some time. That's my big tip um, actually is we don't realize it that we don't heat our pans before we put our oil. And that is why a lot of things stick to the pan. So, because, so make sure that you heat your pan for at least three, four minutes before you put anything into it. And trust me on this one, nothing will stick to it. <laughs> um, doesn't have to be non-stick, nothing will stick to it. So, I, yeah, I really didn't know that. I'm definitely trying that tomorrow when I'm cooking. Please try it, yes. Um, and so here I've just mixed everything up, all the ingredients, you'll get access to the recipes. Um, white toast, whatever bread is there in house, put them all on top. So I kind of layered the Alfredo sauce at the bottom first, put all the ingredients over it um, at the slow gas, of course, and then cover it up and cook it. 15 minutes or so, 12, 15 minutes. The base gets toasty uh, and the cheese melts on the top. Um, and you have like a quick snack or a, a accompaniment with a salad for lunch, quick lunch. And honestly, it goes away so fast because it comes out delicious. Now I have put these ingredients, but you can also try with corn. You can put whatever is available in your freezer. If you have um, a bag of corn, uh, you know, defrost it, wash it, put that in the mixture. And it's gonna taste delicious. Uh, every, my, my son loves this, my husband likes this a lot, so I do make this very often for snacks, uh, for the tea, four o'clock tea in the evening when I come back from work. <laughs> uh, um, I have used white bread here because my son loves uh, white bread, but you can use whatever kind of bread you have, whole wheat or whatever. And, uh, uh, on, and also this goes very well with, uh, 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 you know, a soup, if you have a nice tomato soup. This is like the Indian grilled cheese because grilled cheese and soup is like a great combination. So you can make soup and then make this quickly and you have a very quick dinner together, which the men in the family can do it honestly, like, and they'll be so happy because it'll come out great. So <laughs> this is great, Nena. And uh, what I particularly like is, you know, how easy it is to put together. So this is just about doing some basic chopping and just put everything in a pan, slow heat it a little bit, just you know, it's literally put layer everything on top of your toast and just cook it and you're done. Absolutely. So, so again, like I, like I requested, anyone can put this together. And that's exactly what, you know, um, is what we are hoping that everybody will do. I mean, especially uh, men, especially teenage children, people who haven't ventured much into the kitchen earlier. This is a great break in point. So start from here and then you can grow from here. Now, I know you did share one more recipe, so I'm going to yes. go on to the next picture and then you can tell us about that one. Sure. Okay, so now this is um, um, a tofu scramble. Again, uh, this was born out of, um, I was asked to uh, cook for a, a yoga camp in upstate New York, where I actually had to go and stay over there. I was like the in-house chef with them for two days. And they wanted me to make breakfast for about 150 people. Wow. So, wow. So, yeah, so this is what came up in my mind. And I made this and it's very easy to put together. Again, like I wanted something easy in the morning so that I could make for 150 people. And this was, um, again, it's tofu, which you may not have in your fridge all the time, but I do have tofu all the time in my fridge. Um, scrambled, scrambled tofu with onions and uh, celery, chilies, carrots, and cilantro. If you don't have carrots, you can, uh, you know, definitely omit it. But I, 
I'm very visual with my food and I think that's where my graphic designing comes in is I like to mix things with color. Like when I, when I set up a, a menu, if I've called somebody over for dinner and if I'm making the menu, I always think in colors. Okay, if I have something white, how about something orange and then something red and then something purple and then something green. So I kind of play my menu accordingly. I make my menu according to the colors. Um, so this is obviously, and then this is also very easy to put together and it's almost kind of like a fusion recipes. If I, if I can use that term because that term has been used so loosely over these years, the fusion, the word fusion, but it's basically you put oil. Um, I, uh, you know, I personally like coconut oil. So that's what I use because I like the taste of it, but you can use regular oil, cumin seeds, celery, onions, carrots, everything goes together. So you're not like sorting the onions first and then putting the rest of the stuff and we, and so saute everything, put everything in here, turmeric. And then um, for a little sweetness, I added cranberries, the dried cran cranberries that everybody has. I hope everybody has it in their kitchens. And if you don't have cranberries, raisins. Raisins works great too. Put everything together, saute it, and then use it as a wrap. Um, you know, put it in a wrap, put it in a sandwich. But, you know, I served it as a wrap and... Um, Trust me on this one, this comes out so fast and so quick and nobody will miss an egg afterwards because it does taste like a scrambled egg. Um, so, so you can do this with, um, when you say wrap, you can do this with a regular chapati or would you do this yes. with like a fajita or uh, anything? I, anything, actually, even a chapati would be great with this. You know, this, this also makes a great um, lunch for kids because you can just roll it up and take it. So, and this recipe really literally comes together in 10 or 15 minutes. So uh, anybody can do this, change it according to, if you don't like celery, don't add the celery, but the onions kind of add a nice sweetness to it and crunchiness to it because we're not sorting the onions for too long. Um, put this together, put some cheese on it, put some greens on it and it becomes a nice wrap. Yeah, it actually, you know, looking at these pictures, and I'm just going to go back to this one. It looks delicious because you can see the onion, which is slightly sauteed. You can see the tofu. Uh, you can kind of see a little bit of the cumin. So, you know, there is that little bit of flavor in there with it. And then, uh, of course, the cranberry is going to give it a um, slightly sweet taste with the savory. So it looks really delicious. Thank you. And so, you know, when I made this for 150 people, it was very easy to put together a whole big batch of it and then just put it into the wraps, wrap it up and give it to them for breakfast. Wow. Um, and wow. Uh, it has been a hit, you know, my, a lot of my friends love this. Um, I take it for lunch too at work. Um, and sometimes I just quickly sort it from uh, Sunday afternoon lunch for myself. So, Elena, so uh, sorry, Supri, when are you going next to the subject? Because I teach yoga, I'll make sure I Go, go to the same space because this food looks really good. Uh, thank you. I'll we'll talk about that. This, you know, it was an upstate New When I go next time, I'll definitely Please take you. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, um, Nena, now that you've shared these recipes with us, where do we find them? Okay, so now you can. Um, I'm building my website, which would have been ready today, but I had some technical issues. <laughs> so I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna need like a little bit more, few days for my website to be up, but. Um, if you like my Instagram page, uh, you know, I'm sh I'll share it over there. Supreet will share the recipe. She has the recipe. Supreet will uh, share it across all the uh, platforms that she uh, uh, advertised in the evite that she has. So, uh, uh, we can even put it up on um, uh, my Facebook. I have a Facebook page called Culinary Karma. So please, uh, you know, you can access it from there also. I will put it in the next couple of days over there. Um, Shweta can share it with on her websites, so it'll be available everywhere. And then, if you want, uh, you know, if you're going to send out the recording of the uh, session later on, you can probably add it as an attachment. Um, it's in a PDF format, so you can add it as an attachment, and you'll see how quick these recipes come together. So, from my end, there's going to be a follow-up email that's going to come after our event to everyone who registered via the event, right? Because those are the people for whom I have your emails, and I will be sharing this as part of the email. So, the recipes are part of the email. Uh, since, like Nana said, we're sharing it across all platform. One of the things I will say is, ladies, please share your recipes. Tell us the ones which are quick and easy to do. We'd love to have recipes put together, which you can then go to and say, you know what, it's my break today. My teenage child is cooking or my spouse is cooking or somebody else is doing this. Here's what you can go to 
pick up, look at it, do it. Uh, it's me time, so I'm not doing this today. And so you have something that you can refer to. So we would love your recipes. If you're trying out Nena's recipes, or if you're trying out or sending us a recipe, you want to make a short video, take a photograph, please tag it on Instagram. Yeah, tag tag Nana's, uh, Nana's Instagram, tag Zehen, which is what I do. Uh, Zehen's Instagram. I will, like I said, share all the details via email. Let us know what you're doing. And as a result of this, certainly as far as I'm concerned, for me, Get Men in the Game was just the start. I want to know what's next. How are you taking this forward? Is this really working for you? How do you think we need to do things differently? So do let me know how that's working. I'd love to hear from you either on email or on Instagram, or you know, you can leave a message on my website. So let us know what's working, what's not working. That really helps me know um, how to move this conversation forward. So that would be that would be great. So thank you for that. Nena, I love these recipes. I really okay. love these. I, I'm definitely, I'm not a fan of tofu, but that looked exciting. I'm trying this out now, for sure. Can, yeah, please. And you can try it with paneer too. Um, you know, obviously paneer gets a little hard. It's not as soft as paneer in India is. But the tofu kind of really makes it fluffy like an egg. So you don't miss egg at all. But definitely try it with paneer if you don't like tofu. Absolutely. And, and, and let me know. Send a picture, tag it. Um, and, and let me know if it didn't come out good. Even then, let us know because nobody's trying to be perfect over here that's the whole point uh, i you know uh, we put up such beautiful pictures of uh, food on our social media um but at the same time i wonder why people sometimes don't put failures up there like the other day i made a cookie uh, out of a flour that i don't know what it is mystery flour because i got a packet of flour and i put it in a jar i removed it into a jar threw the packet away and i have no idea what that is it was a terrible experiment. <laughs> it was because I had no clue what the flour is, but I'm not giving it up because I'm going to try it again. And I'll probably put the whole succession of, the, of my, uh, from failure to, well, these cookies came out really nice and I have no idea what it is, <laughs> what the flour is in here. Uh, so put up the pictures and let me know, or let Supreet know, let Shweta know how it turned out and how easy it is or how difficult it turned out for you. And this is where the connections are, Nena. I love how you've yet again built the connection with what we do on a daily basis and how mentally healthy we keep ourselves. You said it, your words. I think the 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 sentence for today is, nobody needs to try to be perfect absolutely and that's true why are we not putting up our failures on instagram saying i tried this and oops it didn't really work well i have a lot of those moments i have far more of those moments than the ones when things go exactly according to plan i can't remember the last time i had things go exactly according to plan and so you know to your point it's about the learning it's about trying it once and saying, okay, let me try it another time and let me see how that goes. And that in itself, because you're acknowledging and you're saying, you know, it's okay for me to fail. It's okay for me not to do this well, that we are keeping ourselves really mentally healthy because we're not stressing ourselves out, you wondering. Anxiety by just doing that. And also I would like to add that, Supreet, like for women, again, I go back to South Asian women, just the way a lot of us have been brought up, it's, it's about these manicured appearances. By appearances, I don't mean physical appearances, like the job, the grade, the school, the meal, everything is so manicured. Like what would it like to be to sit in a, like, you know, play with a bowl of basin, for instance. Like we've never, we've never learned to do that. Like don't make a mess. Instead of saying, let's see what we can do with this. It's about don't make that mess. And like so much, of course, when it comes to a clinical level, it's different. But for a, for a lot of, a lot of us, anxiety is also, it's like ebbs and flows, right? And this, this thing that Nana touched upon and Supreet and I've talked about it, like we can lower the anxiety again by the way we eat, but also the way we treat ourselves. Mm -hmm. We as women have to stand up for ourselves. And by standing up, I don't mean standing up in the middle of the street, like with a morcha or anything, just saying no. You know, I'm showing up to life and it's fine. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be imperfect. Just showing up sometimes is enough. And that's such a great way of putting it. Just being there, just showing up and just saying, I'm going to give this a try. And you're like, I like the idea of playing with this. And I, you know, I think I'm going to do that. Just 
try something crazy and see how that works. And I'm going to invite everyone to do that as well. Um, so I have one more question for both of you, and then I'm going to open it, open it up to the audience for any questions. And so the same question, uh, and Nana, why don't you go first? is what's next for you so you know i you've told us you've got a book coming out you've told us that you're very involved with cooking um is the book your next step or is there anything else what's next for you i wish i had the little crystal ball at this moment <laughs> um honestly trying very hard uh trying to manage my time because i have a full-time job and i also um freelance. Uh, I'm a freelance graphic designer as well. I do have a couple of freelance clients that I work on daily basis. Um, I'm sorry. I think the landscaper is here. Really? <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so uh, trying to manage time, tackle a uh, time and uh, come up with the book. Testing recipes is not easy uh, because I have to test them and take pictures in the morning because of the sunlight. Uh, I get good just in the morning as opposed to if I come back from work and take pictures. And also I have some great testers at work. My friend, um, I'm going to call her out over here, Satya, if you're here. <laughs> uh, she is amazing. And I take a lot of food to her. It's like, let me know how this is, you know, on one to five, how is this? Because then I can add that to my recipe or something. And she's been great. So I do miss giving people food. That's another thing. I love making food, but also I love feeding people. And I love giving my food away um, to friends like we did in India, you know, Dabba Bharke, and you were like, <laughs> take this a little bit and take this a little bit. So I love doing that. So I kind of miss that a little bit, but I do have a lot of friends that I share my food with and then ask them for their opinions. Uh, uh, so I'm going to try, try very hard for this year, but if not, it's, it's going to be a self-published book. Um, I was being very uh, kind of like wanted it to be a hardcover Simon and Schutz book, but I think I'm going to go the route of self-publishing for now. And then uh, honestly, it's going to be follow my passion, follow, uh, do what really makes me happy. And right now cooking, making connections, making connections makes me very happy. And through food, making connections through food makes me very happy. To have people over and cook for them makes me really happy. So I'm going to continue doing that and then at the same time start writing everything that I've done and then hopefully next year the book will be out. Nana, that's a lovely way of putting it. Firstly, wish you all the very best with your Thank book. Thank you. I, my takeaway from what you've said is um, do what makes you happy. And yes. I, when you do that, you actually find you end up doing a good job because you're happy doing what you're doing. Yes. So, so really, thank you for that. Um, thank you for being here today. I am not ending this, but I just wanted to say my personal thanks to you when I reached out to you to actually say, you know, yes, you were equally enthusiastic. Yes, let's try it out. So I really appreciate that attitude. Um, no, thank you, Supri. Thank you for having me on this panel. And thank, uh, and you, yeah. thank you, Shweta. Thank you for uh, recommending me. <laughs> uh, and Shweta, so what's next for you? So, you know, I just realized when you asked us to introduce ourselves, I got so caught up in the mental health moment. I did <laughs> for those of you who don't know, aside from yakking a lot, um, I'm an Ayurveda and mindset coach, a global speaker, and I've authored 12 books. Um, so my, my world, my happiness, my Zen is my husband makes fun of it. He's like, if someone paid you, you would just keep working out, wouldn't you? Like, that's how happy it makes me. So by working out, I just mean the mental flossing, physical flossing, all of that. Right. So, my core focus is women's empowerment, writing and wellness and an amalgamation of all of that. So how do you help people become more creative and productive using food, lifestyle tips, mental health? Um, and my core is helping women live their best life, right? It's such a cliched thing to say, but live life on your own terms. And, um, and I was talking about this to him yesterday. I was like, you know, we are often told this one was invisible. That one's women need to stop giving so much power to others, especially South Asian women. We've always been someone, something, someone's daughter, someone's sister, wife, mother. So become visible on your own terms. And that comes from following your heart, your passion, what makes you come alive. For me, I'm writing wellness columns for SEMA as well. I'm writing wellness columns for another magazine, for a lot of them. Um, I teach workshops across colleges, the city, um, Ayurveda mindset, a uh, lot of webinars at this point, not in person. And I have a book coming out. It 
either this year, it depends on how COVID-19 ends up treating us towards the end, um, either later this year or early next year. And it's basically using Ayurveda and mindset to really thrive on your best terms because what works for you doesn't work for me and we should have a customized approach to what works for each of us. So thank you, Supreet, um, for making me a part of this conversation. And I just want to add one thing, the friend whose story I was telling you all towards the beginning, he ended up committing suicide. So that's an extreme case. So, but the reason I wanted to bring it back because it's May, it's mental health awareness, and we've been talking about this. If you feel something doesn't feel okay, please go talk to someone. I know we've, our culture doesn't permit us to do that, but you know what, two hoots to that. Like you matter in your life, your wellness matters in your life. And there's nothing to be ashamed or afraid of. It's not in our hands. So the way you would go see a doctor, if you had a stomach ache or you know your ankle hurt, the same thing, if you're not feeling okay for a few days, every now and then we all go through ebbs and flows. But if you feel like it's been a week and you've still felt crappy every day, please go talk to someone. I wish my friend and his mom had gotten help because he would still be here with us today. So thank you. Thank you, Shweta, for actually highlighting the importance of this. Uh, from my side, a really a deeply felt thanks for participating in today and you know, being a part of this conversation and discussion. Mental health is very, very important. I know the focus is South Asian women, but it's really important for each and every individual as we go on to increasingly stressful lives. I was actually reading an article on um, the research that's been done, especially about the South Asian community. And um, one of the things that is very clearly highlighted is because the South Asian community rejects the concept of mentally being unwell, it gets classified under various names and is actually not even recognized that it's an issue. And that's a major part of the problem. And you're right when you say that, you know, two hoots about what the culture says, I would put it a little more, um, a, a little more, I would build the link to say, rather than saying two hoots, I think it's time for us to say, we need to redefine what our culture needs to look like moving forward. We need to take from the old what works for us, and we, we need to discard what doesn't work for us. And that's really been the way it has been throughout ages. But it's time we took that into our own hands rather than, you know, letting that change kind of happen from outside when it will. And we need to actually actively drive that change process. So once again, invite people in the conversation, like your friends or family, you know, sometimes we assume people won't get, and we are all smart, intuitive adults. We know who will get and who won't. So it might be helpful to take somebody into confidence and just say, you know, this is how I've been feeling like, and it, that itself helps to know that, oh, I have that support. Like you're taking this path and you have that support. Absolutely. That's, that's, you're right. Just go to somebody who you can talk to. So once again, Shweta, thank you. And now I'm going to open this up for questions and comments. Um, I, I know we have a couple of comments, um, I, you know, from people who are saying thanks, but would anybody like to comment? Uh, maybe Please, share. Uh, this is Prima. I have a question. Yeah. For Shweta. Sure. Um, thank Hi, you so Prima. much for uh, bringing this important topic for all of us to uh, think about and consider. It's very, very important for us to put ourselves uh, in a position where we are not feeling um, that way. So I, I totally um, uh, agree that they, we have to give more importance to mental health, especially South Asian women. Uh, so when someone feels overwhelmed or feels cornered or feels like there's not too many options or um, and the option of talking to someone at home is not there. What is the, what are some of the resources that she can reach out to or uh, because for us, South Asian women, culturally uh, specific, um, you know, um, discussion is important because uh, a lot of others may not understand why we can't talk about certain things or why we feel certain things are taboo. That's, that's such a great point, Prima. Firstly, thank you so much for uh, being a part of this conversation and raising this extremely important point. So one place is psychology today. You can put the zip code and you can find a therapist in that zip code. I came across this organization and 
I, I'll send the link to Supreet. I think it's Samahini, and I'm probably mispronouncing it. They're in New Jersey, and they yes, work uh, with... South, Hill, South Asian Mental Health Network. Yes. yes. So, mm -hmm. you know, something as specific as that would be important, might be helpful to get a conversation going. You know, I, like, I feel like um, support group is sometimes very loosely defined or sometimes too much of a label on it. But like just finding people to your point, Prima, you know, somebody who's not from the culture might not understand why that cumin seed was the reason behind an argument and why that might have triggered someone because it might have a childhood memory attached to it. So speaking to a professional within the culture uh, might be helpful for reference points. So that might be a good place to start. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions, any comments? You know, what do you feel about the discussion we've had today? I'd love to hear from you. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, hi, Sukrit. Hi, Sveta. Thank hi. you very much for organizing it. Good to see you here. Nana, I enjoyed your recipes here and I'm going to give them a try. Thank you. My so question much. is for Sweeta. As you said that uh, everybody has their own way of defining how healthy they are. Right. I've been hearing a lot about intermittent fasting and I do have mixed feelings about it. I know it goes back that that's how we used to do. We used to fast for one day and that would get all the, the toxins out of your body. But that does that really work that you need to have that many hours of empty stomach before you take on your next meal? So I'll answer that again. I love this question because I can go on and on about intermittent fasting. It's one of my favorite things to do watching YouTube videos on intermittent fasting. I'm obsessed. Um, so there is a scientist who won, and I really kid you not, he, he won a Nobel Prize, I think, in 2016. He's a Japanese scientist on intermittent fasting and autophagy. So I know nutrition these days, and I have a background in Ayurvedic nutrition and Western sports nutrition. So Western nutrition will tell you eat every three hours because your blood sugar levels will dip. Ayurveda tells you eat when you're hungry, which is most people are not hungry more than twice a day. So that mm -hmm. automatically becomes intermittent fasting. Again, I am not a doctor, so please speak with your doctor before you try anything new. I personally, I like intermittent fasting because what it does is the blood sugar levels don't go up and down and I don't have like a blood sugar issue, but I realize it also cuts the cravings. It cuts down work if you're not snacking throughout the day. Um, and there are different ways of doing intermittent fasting. You can fast for 16 hours, eat within an eight hour window. Some people do alternate days. Some people like will eat 500 calories for five days and then eat whatever they want for seven days. The reason I like intermittent fasting personally is it takes care of inflammation. And the world that we live in, uh, just the food, the stress, brain issues, like mind issues are also oftentimes inflammation of the brain, right? If you're eating just sugar, it's inflamed. It's sending that same signal to the brain. That's inflamed. So I like my sugar, by the way. So I'd much rather do intermittent fasting and then eat my desserts on the side. But I, so um, for a lot of reason, it helps people with blood pressure, like a lot of ailments, people with serious health issues, intermittent fasting, that's what research says. And I started to look into it after this scientist really won the Nobel Prize because how it's helping people really lower down their numbers, whether it's the cholesterol numbers, the blood sugar numbers and things like that. So it might be worth looking into, but I would like just talk to your doctor. Like, is it for your, that's where my Ayurveda nerd cap comes out. Is it right for you or not? True. Yeah, you're right. That's what even I've been wondering that is my body going to accept this because I'm kind of a person who wants to eat something in the morning. If I don't, I get headaches. I used to be that person. Breakfast was the most important meal for me until I started doing this. And I, I realized like I feel better, but doesn't mean it works for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sushana. That was a great question. And actually, even I wondered about it. So it was good to hear, you know, um, the perspective of how it actually works. I didn't, by the way, this is what happens when you're ignorant. I didn't even know someone won the Nobel Prize. And that's how it came into the limelight. So you live and learn every day, Shweta. So thanks for that. Uh, anybody else? I'd, I'd love a couple of more comments. Anyone from? from yeah, our... this is the bear. Yeah, this is the bear. I, I, I think it's also psychological when you do these things. Um, you know, I did it for a period of time. I was at work. I'm the kind of person who would need my morning breakfast and as soon as I go and start your day. 
and then I started doing it and I loved it. And then came COVID and you're si sitting home and everybody's asking for breakfast and it fell apart. But I think it's how you train your mind. Uh, it falls in place when you start doing it and you start loving it. You know, your body starts loving it. Um, so I think it's mental training as well. And thank you, uh, Divya, for sharing that. It goes back to the point that Nana was making about people like to project perfect lives. Um, and that's what it is. Like my intermittent fasting went through uh, out the window for a month because it was COVID-19. I live in New York. We couldn't get groceries. So when we got groceries, I had like Oreos in the house. I'm like, hell no, I'm not letting go of the Oreos. So I stuffed myself with pie and Oreos and I'm like, calm down. You know what? Just So it, it, it's, it was the mindset thing. Like I went through my phase of... I'm going to eat Oreos and I hadn't brought Oreos in the house in like literally five or six years. And I was like, the world is coming to an end. I might as well eat Oreos. Everyone has their priorities, right? <laughs> so but the point being, and when I got back into it, I realized like for me anyway, my energy levels were back at where they were pre-COVID when I wasn't stuffing myself with pie and Oreos. So uh, it's very interesting, Shweta. It looks like there is a very clear connection with sugar and inflammation. Oh, very much so. Um, did you know, Supreet, that sugar is way more addictive than cocaine? They've done these tests. Um, and yeah, so it has, and breaking down any kind of habit takes 21 days. So like when you hear about this 21 day XYZ, uh, reboot your body, booty, whatever, however they uh, publicize all of that stuff, because 21 days is what it takes for the mind to reset. And yes, yeah, so, I mean, like much as I'm a, you know, I have a sweet tooth, but I, like I'll have these sort of discipline in place. Like I don't believe in life of deprivation. I believe in a life of permission because it's mind games, right? Otherwise it'll be like, oh, let me binge today. So like, you know, just limiting moderation is key. Eating good kind of sugars. And I don't mean just fruits, but like sometimes jaggery or raw cane sugar or go to Nana's website and find out all these yummy things that she makes. Like, you know, where it's not white sugar because there's, you also live once. So I would never, unless there's a health condition, enjoy things while we are here but again move your body and meditate so your meditation will tell you why are you wanting that sugar and and that means nena we are actually all going to be looking for your orange cake recipe yes. <laughs> now, can i just um, share a tip actually because i know we are talking about uh, uh, mental wellness over here um, and I multitask a lot, you know, I, when I'm stepping out of the office, um, I'm always thinking, oh, I need this. I need to stop at the grocery store and get this. And then I have to go to the dry cleaners and pick this up. And, you know, 10 other things that you want to do. Um, and then I go to the grocery store and I will forget something that I really needed. So like my lentils was over. Oh my God, I didn't pick up the lentils and I completely forgot that. Or I'll get an extra packet and then that'll stay in the, because I'm like, I won't realize it that I already had one in the pantry. So this is one thing that I started doing this some time back and it really helps. So for all the women out there who are multitasking, uh, just just as a, a, a little help to, in your pantry, you know how you keep all your um, bottles of lentils and flowers and everything in your pantry, right. move the ones that's getting over in the front, but then don't use completely. So like right now I have this mixed lentils Okay. This is actually just the packet that comes in because I make dosas out of them. And that got, oh, so I used everything except for one teaspoon or one tablespoon or whatever. So this I keep in the front. So when I'm going to the grocery store, I open the pantry mm -hmm. and then visually it's there. Oh, I need this one. So it's visually, you, it keeps a, a reminder in your mind as like, oh, I needed that one. Because if this bottle, if I had used this completely, I would not have known that I needed this lentil right so just leaving a little bit in your bottle is a great help in organizing your mind and letting your mind know that when you go to the grocery store this is what you need for next time um just wanted never to done that I, I i've never done that and I, I i think that's that's a great way of looking at it so i'm going to try that out as well yeah and the second one actually is very funny so don't laugh at me please <laughs> but i kind of plan if if i know the weather channel has um, said uh, you know there's going to be heavy rain tomorrow I take my trash can, empty it out, spray it with, uh, you know, fantastic Lysol, whatever, and I keep it in the deck open. So the rain washes my trash can. <laughs> then I leave it over there for the sun to dry it up and I bring it in again. I didn't have to take it to the bathroom to scrub it or do anything, wipe it off. Your trash can is clean. This has worked great for me and uh, 
it's a good takeaway tip. <laughs> I, it, this, is, this is a lovely takeaway tip because um, the trash can, I, I'm the one who was, you know, starts running when it gets all smelly and icky. So I'm going to do that next time for sure. That's, that's depends, a great depending, tip. Yeah, and depends on whether the weather is going to rain. <laughs> Well, yeah, it ends up before. raining sometime <laughs> or the other, so. Yes. <laughs> rain tomorrow might be time for all the women to get their trash cans. Yeah, cans. Pick, up our, <laughs> pick up our Lysol and pick up the trash cans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> started this. <laughs> and, and I think this is a great note for us to end this conversation, unless there are any other comments by everyone. Um, I really do want to say, uh, yes, I um, think we have somebody, uh, Arnaz, uh, please. Yeah. Just real quickly, uh, thank you. Uh, this was very uh, informative and fun. Uh, Nana invited me, by the way. I know Nana last 20 years and everything she's fed me, there was nothing I did not like. So, <laughs> and all my friends have heard so much about her. So, uh, Nana, you can say hello to Piroja, Jaru, and Daisy. Oh, hi, Piroja. Hi, Daisy. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we are Zoroastrian women. We love to feast, no fasting for us. And we don't give away power to anybody either. So I just wanted to share that. And um, the other thing is on the meditation part, I'm relatively new to it, but I just wanted to share my experience that for the last three months I have been doing it and it's very effective. So if anybody else wants to try, that would be wonderful. And, you know, just they say to do it regularly, which I'm trying and it, it's really helpful in these challenging times. So that was uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you again. Uh, Sweta, we met at uh, yes, Nena's. <laughs> so yeah, we, I hope to join in uh, for the others. Thanks again for the invite, Nena. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah. And Arnaz, I love your uh, tip about how you personally tried meditation, especially now in this environment, which is stressful for so many of us. Yeah. And, you know, you're finding it's really working for you. So this is great. I, I have to say that I am one person who's been a huge skeptic of meditation in the past until it realized or slowly dawned on me that a lot of what I do with what I consider my me time is actually a form of meditation. So when I'm kind of, um, I think I would put it as saying uh, when I'm in my zone, that's my meditation because that's when I'm decluttering my mind of everything else. So we can call it by that name or call it by different names, but we all benefit from doing some form of me time or meditating or, you know, I, I'm sure there's better terminology that Shweta knows around it, but that that's really what it is. And for all of us who haven't tried it in whatever way or shape or form that works for you, give it a go. Right. Yep. I always food it, but when I tried it and I'm really like into it now, I'm hooked. You know, I do it at least three, four times a week, half hour with this group. Uh, there's a community who does it. Yeah. So I try to join in. I just thought I'd share my experience. So Anybody yes. Yeah. Thank you. So with that, I, with that, I think we are we are beyond time. So I, I need to bring this to a close. I, I really do want to say a, a very personal and deep thank you to both Shweta and Nena for today. I think um, we've, we've realized, uh, and this is why this was surprising connections, because they are surprising connections to what makes up mental health for all of us. We don't think about them. We think this is just, you know, in the daily course of life. But many, many things are connected. And Shweta and Nena really brought that home to us very well today. A big thank you to both of you. A very big thank you to everyone who stayed with us and listened to, you know, our entire conversation. Like I shared, this conversation will be up on, um, I, I, I'll put the link on the website, but basically it's going to go on the YouTube channel. So I've created a YouTube channel called Zehen I Saw. So I'm, I'm going to take one minute and just share with you what Zehen is. Zehen is actually an Urdu word, which means consciousness or mind. Um, and I find that the reason why, um, well, I don't find the reason why I'm doing this is because I realize more and more that the world I've lived in as a South Asian woman is no longer the world my children will live in. And I want to be part of making that a better world rather than be the category that says, no, you just have to do what worked in the past, even though there's no reason or logic or it, you know, it's not really going to help you, but hinder you, but you've still got to do it. Uh, so that's not what I want, not just for my children, but for my culture, for my society. And so 
Uh, this is part of a series of events that I'm doing simply to celebrate and spotlight, spotlight South Asian women. I also find, especially in, in New Jersey, where there is such a large South Asian population, there are conversations about Latina women, there are conversations about other minorities, about African American women, but very few conversations about South Asian women. And we have our own unique culture, and our culture both defines us and drives us. And we need to, as I said earlier, take parts of that culture and see this is really very, very good and we need to retain this. But like shedding old skin, there's things we need to shed. And so I want to just help facilitate the conversations. Uh, and as those conversations create that consciousness, that change, I hope, is going to come, come about. That's my, that's my focus. That's my purpose. Uh, that's why I do these. Uh, in my follow-up email, you will have my website, you will have the YouTube channel. I would love to hear from all of you on what are the topics you think that are relevant that we can talk about more, and I will pick them up. And anything that you think that is worthwhile, please do share with me. So you've been an awesome audience. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you being here today. And You'll be hearing from me every time I do these events. Just keep an eye out and I, I hope you can join us. And Shweta and Nena, I cannot thank you enough. We're going to do more stuff on Instagram. We're going to do more stuff on social media. And we're going to be sharing Nana's recipes. And then everyone try them out and let us know how they went. And cooking them. And cooking them, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, ladies. Have thank a you. wonderful thank evening you. and a thank wonderful you. weekend. Thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. All right. Thank Bye. you.